for coming and uh, this is uh, today we have the pleasure to uh, have Carlos Silva presenting to the RQMP. I don't think Carlos needs to be introduced to our crowd so we know him quite well He's a good friend uh, and so we're very happy that he, uh, we could see some of the work that he's been doing uh, since uh, he went to the other side of the border. Um, let me say a few things about Carlos uh, still. Um, so Carlos got his PhD at the University of Minnesota in uh, 1998. Uh, he then went for a postdoctoral research associate in the group of Richard Friends in the Cavendish Laboratory. Uh, and this is where I met him. So I met him over there, over tea. So that's where we, uh, we first chat. Um, he stayed at Cambridge in, um, in England until 2004. And during the last few years, he was a APSRC uh, Advanced Research Fellow, still at the Cavendish. And then in 2004, he came to University of Montreal, actually in 2005, where he, uh, he was a professor there until 2017. Um, and this is where we collaborate a lot and you guys all know him from uh, different collaborations. And in 2017, he uh, received an offer he cannot refuse from Georgia Institute of Technology. And so he went there to uh, promote his, uh, or to actually put good science over there. Okay. So over his career, Carlos received quite a lot of few awards. I'm just gonna mention a few. Um, he was uh, recently made fellow of the American Physical Society. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And in particular in Canada, he received two noticeable prize. He got the Brookhouse medals in 2016. And he was also, he received the uh, Erzboat, Erzbeck medal in, um, from the CAP in 2010. So thank you, Carlos, for accepting our invitation. And we look forward to see uh, what you've been uh, doing as research. Are you, uh, just a question, do you want to uh, entertain questions during the presentation? Uh, we, we can make this as informal as people want. I'm very happy to entertain questions as we go along and, and we can treat this okay. like a the discussion amongst friends, which is what it is, right? So, so yes. let's do that. Uh, yes, so, and what so, I will do then, what I will do is that people who have questions, they can raise their hands in the, uh, in the uh, you know, using the, the Zoom, uh, raise your hand. And when I see that it's a proper uh, moment to stop Carlos, I will stop Carlos and I will allow people to ask their questions, okay? So right, Carlos, right. you don't need to worry about checking okay. anything. Okay, would, okay, yeah, all right. Definitely. All right, so when we get questions rather than insults, then we, we, we will stop it. <laughs> so yeah. thank you very much, uh, uh, Michelle, for, for the introduction. It really is a great pleasure for me to, to uh, to, to, to discuss this with you today because, you know, it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, still, still very much part of me, the RQMP, and so, so I'm very happy to be participating today. So, so this is a story, it's, it's, it's a summary of a story that has sort of built up over, over the last uh, few years, um, mostly performed at Georgia Tech, uh, started out a little bit in Montreal, and it, it deals with uh, excitons in two-dimensional perovskites, and so, so let me just uh, let me just sort of give you the story. But before I do that, I'm going to here acknowledge a people that actually almost everybody in the, this slide, somebody knows in our QMP. Uh, th this was largely the PhD thesis of Felix Tuan, who who last year defended it, and really it's a it's a spectacular thesis. I was very very proud of it. Uh, but a lot of the intellectual input also comes from R.J. Srimath Kandada, who was a Marie Curie fellow coming from Milan, uh, who, who started in Montreal, but then also moved to, to Georgia Tech, went back to, to Milan to finish the Marie Curie Fellowship. Now is on paper, um, sort of he's in a, in a Trump executive order at alternative reality in Milan, but he is officially assistant professor at, uh, at Wake Forest University. He is actually teaching remotely, but without a visa. So that's kind of the alternative reality we get stuck in. But, uh, but uh, other people who have participated in this work, Ilaria Bargigia is also an assistant professor. She was a postdoc, is actually at Wake Forest. She's an assistant professor, both of them in the physics department at Wake Forest. Uh, she was very uh, uh, active in the data collection and some of the analysis. And of course, somebody, some of you know very well, David, who was very instrumental in some of this data as well. 
So uh, this is the collaboration. You will see some, uh, I will make uh, mention of some of the theoretical work by Eric Bidner, his postdoc Hal, David Bajon and Mons. You will see some of the DFT calculations that they ran on some of, some of the work we did with Claudio, his postdoc. The samples come from, uh, from Milan. So a lot of you know Stephanie, who spent quite, a, quite some time uh, in our group, actually in, in Montreal. And, uh, and there is a structural characterization down to, down to low temperature, down to 30 Kelvin, that is instrumental in the story that I will tell you. It will not be explicitly mentioned, but it is very important. That's a co collaboration with Chachare in, 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 uh, in Singapore and his team. And I want to mention some funding here in the bottom that, that paid for some of the bills. So really the story is about these, this class of materials. This is a two-dimensional metal halide, and in this case, a lead iodide perovskite, in which we uh, basically, it, it's a misnomer. It's really not by any means a perovskite, of course. But the, the idea is that we start with a perovskite-like um, structure in three dimensions with a lead iodide forming these cor corner sharing octahedra with organic cations uh, in, 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 in between in the voids. And we take a uh, single layer, single lattice planes of these and separate them with longer cations. In this case, there's this phenyl ethyl ammonium that separates different uh, layers of the corner sharing octahedra of lead iodide. We form structures that are, look a lot like, like multiple quantum wells. We have a, a rather thin quantum well separated by this barrier of essentially vacuum with these organic cations in between. And so this, this gives rise to very strong excitonic properties. So in the right, we're showing the absorption spectrum of this material. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, reminiscent of what a, a two-dimensional semiconductor might, might, might give you, what you might expect from that. And we, we can identify somewhere some band edge. And but down from the band edge, we have a very well-defined resonance that is basically an exciton. And so this looks like, like a like a Vanier exciton, except that it's extremely strongly bound. This, this is comparable to what you find in, in 2D single layer transitional metal dichalcogenite and uh, where you have quantum and dielectric confinement that gives rise to exciton binding energy, some of the order of a few hundred uh, milli electron volts. Here we are at, uh, in the order of 300, 350 milli electron volts. And this is at room temperature. So very strongly excitonic uh, behavior. The, the one thing that I am not, I couldn't get the animation to quite work out somehow. It stopped working, although it was before. But the, the, what I also want to communicate is that these are very, very dynamic lattices. Uh, so Pat, who I, I believe is in the audience, has had some recent uh, work on perovskites, uh, arguing the uh, solvation-like properties of, 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 the, of the counter ions and so on. The idea is that this very dynamic system, it's a very soft lattice, it's an ionic uh, lattice with, with, with degrees of motion of the organic cation that really influence uh, both the disorder as well as sort of uh, very, through very strong electron phonon coupling, the, the, all, the, all, the, all the properties of the system. And so if we take, if we take gallium arsenide and we, and we work out what the, what, the, uh, what, what the primitivity function is uh, as a function of frequency, we see that you know it, it, between the static and the high frequency limit, there's there's a, a variation of a factor of a few. But if we take uh, the bulk perovskite, lead iodide perovskite, and look at the at the permittivity function between the static and the and the high frequency limit, it's a, about a factor of a hundred difference. Okay, this really tells you that there's this is a very dynamic system, and there's it's an ionic lattice, very strong electron phonon coupling, and the question is. How do the, the cation degrees of freedom as well as the phonons and how does electron phonon coupling uh, play itself in the, in, in the structure of this very strongly bound vanier like exciton? So this is the concept of the exciton polaron that I will develop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to today talk uh, in some, some uh, depth about, not some depth, some, some detail about the linear spectral line shape. I'm really going to focus on the linear absorption spectrum but uh, uh, to discuss the concept of exciton polaron effects. Uh, exciton polarons, are, it's not something that of course is a new concept. This is kind of well discussed in ionic and, uh, and polar lattices, but I'm going to come back to it in, 
in describing how that characteristic, how that character plays into the exciton dynamics, which is something that is highly relevant uh, to, to describe the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the optical properties of these materials. And then I'm going to talk about at the end in a rushed way on the nonlinear spectral line shape. I, 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 we, we do mainly these days multidimensional coherence spectroscopy, and I'm only going to sort of give you the message that we get the results from that uh, after kind of going through the exciton Polaron story. There is a perspective article that Ajay and I wrote that was just published uh, earlier this year in Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters, and that is a good point of, uh, of, of uh, information of, of the story that I'm going to um, tell you about, kind of how this has all developed. Klaus, are you using yes. a pointer or, or not? Uh, well, can, can people yeah. see my cursor? Yeah, you can, we can see that, yeah, the arrow. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll use that, I'll use that okay. uh, more. All right, let, let, me just, let, let me just go back to the, uh, to the concept of the polar on just to, to introduce the terminology. This is a, this is a picture uh, that was just simply taken from Wikipedia. And of course, it, it does portray the concept uh, nicely as things in Wikipedia does do. But as everything in Wikipedia, it's also not quite right in the sense that of course, these are Coulomb interactions that have a distance dependence, right? And so if you have a charge in an ionic lattice, if you put an electron in an ionic lattice, that electron is going to want to pull the positive ions and push the negative ions. And in fact, this is going to, uh, to be through, through the coupling of the normal modes of the, of the, of the system, going to, uh, going to, going to uh, distort the lattice, right? But the degree of distortion is something that, that can be categorized in different limits. We have, so there's this parameter that I'm going to introduce here uh, that is a, a, a mesoscopic parameter that is used to, to characterize the degree of electron phonon coupling and the degree of, of polaronic character. And so through parameters like this, you can, you can work out perturbatively, for example, what are, what are polaron binding energies. But the idea is that if you, t if you take the difference here between high frequency and static limits of the permittivity, in other words, how dynamic the system is, you have things like effective mass, what are the phonon modes that are involved and so on. You can, you can come up with this parameter that allows you to, to characterize what regime you are in, in a polaron. So what is a polaron? A polaron is a, a, a charge that is dressed by the lattice that can range from very local interactions to very long range interactions. So over long range interactions, the distortion is perceived through, through the phonons. Uh, of the system, normal modes that couple to, to that electron. Through, through uh, if the coupling is over a very small range, you tend to localize the interaction and you're in the small polar regime so that you can categorize things in a phase diagram like this. This is uh, something that I'm not going to discuss extensively. It's a so-called adiabaticity parameter. To what extent do, does the coupling uh, to the lattice, the, the, the fact that you've got coupling to normal modes of the lattice makes the eigenstates of the system. That's, that's a parameter that allows you to, to then sort of say within these two parameters, what's a small polar and large polar on regime. And it turns out that in the range that these alphas work out in the perovskites, in the hybrid organic and organic perovskites, one is in an intermediate regime where short range as well as run, long range couplings are important. And so let me just describe that in, 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 the, in the further slide. This is from that perspective article that, we, uh, that, we, uh, that, that I just mentioned. Of course, this figure is not our figure from the article, but we, it's a figure that we cite in the article, where if you look at, <clears throat> at a, a range of systems, so, so let's look at this sort of face-like diagram on the right, where you've got now two essentially uh, Huang Ries parameters. Huang Ries parameters is something that quantifies electron phonon coupling or electron vibrational coupling. And if we have one that, it, that involves long range electron phonon coupling, and another one here that, that, that describes short range electron phonon coupling, and we see how do these two interplay in systems that, we, that, that are well understood. And that allows us to then draw a phase diagram of are the excitations, the electron, the hole, or the exciton, free excitations, self-trapped excitations, 
or somewhere in between where they might have some degree of delocalization, but they're not free excitations. They're still dressed by the, by the lattice. And so if we look at sort of classical semiconductors, we're down here where really the, the long range interactions are going to, uh, uh, couplings are going to dominate. If we look at the, at the, at the uh, organics, so pyrene is, is the example that's here, very short range electron vibrational couplings, uh, couplings of charges to very local carbon-carbon stretch, aromatic carbon-carbon stretch, for example. And so that is in this site where basically excitations are self-trapped or let, you know, we can think about now Frankel exciton regimes, for example. But metal halides, here's silver chloride, silver bromide, uh, they're all in this regime where, where variables like you know, structural variables, temperature and so on, bring us across some transition between self-trapped and free. And we're always uh, to some degree bound to the, to the, to the crystal lattice. So we're, we, the, the excitation is dressed by the lattice to some degree by a local deformation, the electrons and the, the, the holes are pulling and pushing ions very close. And, and this is a, a, a dynamic lattice with, with normal modes. And so this is distorting the lattice around the excitation, but there's also long range excitations that interplay, sorry, long range couplings that interplay that gives us a very complex landscape of the, of the, of the excitation. So this okay. is the, and it's not only static, but it's dynamic. It's a highly dynamic system. Yes. Yeah, um, Tammy asks, is, uh, is uh, alpha measure in these samples? When um, uh, uh, what's measured are, of course, things like the permittivities, okay. uh, you know, effective masses, phonons, and so on. These are measured. And alpha is just a parameter that is sort of determined from that. So, so, so you extract alpha. You extract alpha from measurement, and that is measured. Uh, and, and that is really nothing more than sort of some phenomenological parameter that goes into a perturbative treatment of uh, polaron binding. So you okay. can get polaron binding energies from this. And mm -hmm. in the perovskites, this is in a slide that I'm about to get to, but it's about 40 milli electron volts for okay. these 2D perovskites. Okay. Uh, well, if, if really for bulk perovskites, and it's about the same, not, not that different for. And, 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 and these are just, uh, this is rather, I mean, it, it comes from a simple model, of course, but it is sort of treated as a phenomenological parameter that then we're going to sort of plug into to other developments or just use it as a way to, to like for zoology, like in this, okay. like in this diagram. Mm -hmm. so, so now let me go to the, to the 2D perovskite. So here, here we have in the inset, uh, 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 the, the, the schematic of the perovskite. And again, this is a crystal structure. It's not a cartoon. It comes from the structural characterization that I mentioned from, uh, from our colleague in uh, uh, Chichare. So what I'm showing you here is the linear absorption spectrum at room temperature. Now what I'm doing is just focusing on the exciton resonance. Here's the room temperature. We cool it to 30 Kelvin and we show that too. So one thing is now, let's, let's look at the low temperature one because that's clear. We see very clearly defined where the bandage is. Here's the, the, the band to band transition. Downstream, this main peak, 250 to 300 milli electron volts. Uh, let's just take that as, as the, you know, the, the binding energy, the exciton binding energy, very strongly bound exciton. But as we cool it, we see the structure uh, uh, appearing. Now we don't have a, a signal, six single resonance, but in fact, we see at least two. And, uh, and in fact, it's not only two, I'll show you in a minute. And so what is the structure? This has been uh, discussed since the 1990s uh, for these materials. And, and there is a very reasonable argument that this has to do with spin exchange. There's some degeneracy associated uh, with spin exchange that sort of um, gets lifted. Uh, you would expect three peaks if that was the whole story. There's been speculation about Rajba effect, a, a relativistic effects. If, if you're an electron in an asymmetric potential and there's strong spin orbit coupling, you get accelerated to relativistic velocities. You generate a local magnetic field that lifts spin degeneracy. And that, that has been argued. And, and in fact, the spacing of this has been sort of presented as something that might be consistent with that. But again, I will, I can discuss data that rules out that as at least the main uh, 
the main uh, argument. That's a case space effect that takes a lot of case for this to show up. And if I do a thickness dependence of the single layer perovskite, I have two layers, three layers, four layers. This doesn't change and that's not consistent with the Rajba effect. Uh, people talk about vibronic progressions. There is no phonon or combination of phonons that would account for that. And I will show you, uh, I think very convincingly that these are um, distinct excitons. They're not a progression of the same exciton. So it's not a vibronic effect. And what I'm going to argue is that these are different exciton polarons, that the exciton binding energy is different for different excitons because specifically the way that they couple to the lattice, the way that the lattice dresses them is distinct. So that the binding energy is not only the van, the, like in, 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 a, in, a, in a standard Vanier exciton model, what, what all of the Coulomb interactions are between the electron and the hole, but of course between, between all of the ions and the crystal. And so you have to put into your system Hamiltonian the electron and hole couplings as well as couplings to all of the, all of the ions in the system. And the exciton polaron is an eigenstate of the system. It's not, not that you excite an exciton and it feels the lattice and you form a polaron. The exciton polaron, the way we see it, is an eigenstate of the system. And you'll see that through the, through the coherent uh, multidimensional spectroscopy. Those, those couplings to the lattice are distinct for, for the different excitons, and they are, uh, they, they are governed by, by the exact electron phonon coupling to, uh, to specific modes, which are different for the different excitons. The binding energies turn out to be different for that reason. So that's a story. Well, uh, that's what I'm going to tell you. And okay. I'm going to show you that next, but uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. But yes. First, uh, let's, uh, we have a few questions. David is, let's ask uh, David to, uh, to ask his question. Mm -hmm. Hey, Carlos. So you mentioned Hi. the, um, the uh, Rajba effect um, being ruled out by this sort of peeling back one, two, three, four. But I'm wondering if these, uh, these 2D systems are really to be thought of as decoupled uh, quantum wells uh, of, of basically individual surfaces. So the potential is always two dimensional. It's just that they're, uh, they're stacked. Um, no, no so I, I mean, you, you definitely, the, the electronically the systems are decoupled. But, but uh, in the sense that there's no, there's no um, coherence, let's say, especially between an exciton in one and an exciton in the other. But anything in one, in one there's vacuum essentially between them. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so anything that happens in one, in one well knows about what's going on in the, in the, in the other well because the correlations are definitely still going to be there. That's part of the, 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 the and that's the dynamic disorder which I will try to touch upon at the very end. This is, this is fluctuations in one well can influence the next well. Uh, but there is no, the, the excitons are, are isolated in one well compared to the next well. There are excitons that might feel each other coulombically. And you'll see that in, 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 uh, in, in, in resonant coulomb scattering that I will present at the end. So that's a three-dimensional scattering problem. Mm -hmm. Which is which is which is uh, anisotropic, but 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 the binding is really governed by what's going on mainly in the well, within the well. Okay, okay, thanks. We have also a question uh, from uh, Pat. Okay, Pat, mm -hmm. can you ask your question? I guess you're muted, Pat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have a microphone. So I will ask the I question. See. Yeah. Is there a spectrum to the exciton more than one state? So he's assuming that it is a result of a polar, polaromic, polaromic yeah, interactions. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to develop that in what follows. Okay, I, I, just, I just wanted to give you kind of what my conclusion is going to be and, okay, and then, and then get, get to that. Yeah. So let me just make this point here. Let me just keep driving this point that what we're seeing is that we have uh, four peaks, at least four peaks, with separation and energy of 35 milli electron volts. I'm not going to get into the details of how we've ruled out the main contribution to this from those other um, uh, models or those other hypotheses, but I am going to say that we then developed a hypothesis that these are distinct exciton polarons just by noticing that the 
predicted, and, and it has been measured, in fact, by, by, by a number of groups, mainly by, uh, by uh, vibrational, time result vibrational spectroscopy, that the polaron binding energy for in three-dimensional perovskites and proper perovskites is in the order of 30 to 40 milli electron volts. And so if that's the polaron binding energy, that's a polaron binding energy that we can predict also simply from this solar Froelich type of model with this Froelich coefficient that I introduced at the beginning and a perturbative uh, treatment. You see the numbers here that is, are basically a perturbative treatment. You predict this, this polaron binding energy that matches the spacing between these, these, uh, these, these exciton peaks. So at this point, it's nothing more than a hypothesis. Can it be that we're seeing different, different excitons that with a binding energy that differs by multiples of a polaron binding energy? And that was the hypothesis in this Swiss Rev materials paper in 2018. So why do you do that? And, and I think if, if, you know, Pat and I will go to the pub, well, not really, but let's say we go to the virtual pub and we say, okay, how do we, what would we need to test this? Well, we really need resonance Raman spectroscopy. So that's the next thing. Of course, resonance Raman is pretty challenging in these materials because they're luminescent. So, so actually uh, Vlad, who I don't know if he's in the audience, he did a beautiful job of, of measuring Raman spectra. Uh, resonance Raman always is a little bit of a challenge because these are highly luminescent. But in the time domain, we can do this and we know how to do this. We do transient absorption in a sort of a configuration that essentially gives us, uh, allows us to, to pull out uh, essentially impulsive stimulated Raman components. So here what we are going to do in this data is we're going to do pump probe transient absorption, pumping the, uh, the, the band to band transition. So this is a pretty high energy injecting photocarriers in this system. And this is all done at 5K at the moment uh, for the data on the left. Here we, we pump, we inject photocarriers and that, but we probe in the exciton bleach region. And for no fancy reasons, let's call this exciton A and exciton B. Uh, this has not, no, this, this isn't group theory or anything like that. This is just A and B, John and, John and Jill or something. And, and we, we're, probing, we're probing the bleach and we're pumping photocarriers. We inject photocarriers, we see the bleach, which is, has a complex line shape. There's changes in reflectivity, changes, uh, changes in the, the permittivity as we inject photocarriers, and that's all reflected here. Let's not worry about the dynamics or the line shape of the bleach, but let's notice that there's oscillations here, that if we take away the dynamics and just leave the oscillations, we see these wiggles that right at the peak of this main exit on A, shift in phase. So we have wiggles up, down, up, down, up, down, that, that on this side of the maximum of the absorption, it's down, up, down, up, down, up. And so we, let's just take a projection here. These wiggles, the, those contain spectral information. There's a temperature dependence and there's, there's, uh, there's uh, we won't, let, let's just stick to five Kelvin for the moment, just for time. So I, I can take a Fourier transform of this, and this is basically a resonance Raman spectrum. So over this very low frequency range, this is a resonance Raman spectrum of all the normal modes of phonons that are coupled to the photocarrier. I, I inject photocarriers, the crystal starts wiggling, it starts dancing, and it is those phonons that are, that are coupled to the photocarriers that show up in the spectrum. So this is, a, this is the system that I just showed you. This is another cation, what Stephanie and, and Felix had been doing, sort of doing the, the, the comparison of these two different ions. There's a DFT calculations of, uh, of, of Claudio, uh, uh, um, uh, David Bajon's student, uh, postdoc, uh, that allowed, uh, allows us to, to, to assign the spectrum. And, uh, and, this, um, and this basically we, we, we can, we can say that these different modes are all in plane, let, high, let, uh, let iodide um, modes mainly in plane. And there's one here at, at, at the highest energy in this range that has some out of plane distortion as well. You can't really easily see the vector diagrams here, but if you go to this paper, you can download movies that show you what these, what these normal modes are. So we've got these modes. Now what we want to do is do an excitation dependence. The data that I've shown you here is exciting pretty high up here in the conduction band, so we're injecting photocarriers. And what I showed you was this sort of projection spectrum. Here are the different modes going in energy up, M1 to M6 here. 
This is the same thing except that now resolved in probe energy. Remember, this is pump probe. So this is the region that we're probing around the bleach of the exciton. And these lines here are the maximum of exciton A and exciton B. So again, you saw this phase shift around exciton A. All of these normal modes, this Raman spectrum is all centered around exciton A. You see exciton B, not much activity. We go to lower in energy and we see basically the same thing. We're still injecting photocarriers, albeit with lower energy. But when we resonantly excite the two excitons, we see very different things. So we resonantly excite, excite exciton A. Now we're pumping into exciton A and probing around exciton A and exciton B. And in that case, we still see the Raman activity centered around the maximum of the bleach or of the absorption spectrum of exciton A. But now this mode, this is what we had called M2, is completely dominant and all of these other lose amplitude. And in the resonance Raman experiment, the amplitude of the Roma, Raman mode tells you what is the degree to which that particular normal mode is coupled to the photo excitation. You've injected a photo excitation through electron phonon coupling, you've set the crystal in this sort of coherent vibrational motion. And it is mainly, mainly this one that is coupled to exciton A with much lower, let's say Huang Ri's parameter for all the other modes. This one, for example, is completely gone. Well, within, of course, the signal to noise. But now we, we, we excite uh, resonantly exciton B. Now we see that the activity is around the, the, the maximum of exciton B. And now the, the intensity distribution of this is, again, completely different to the photocarriers, but completely different to exciton A. So exciton A and exciton B see the perceive the lattice very differently to each other and to photocarriers. They are dressed by the lattice in a very distinct way. If this was a vibronic progression, this would not be the case. So they're distinct excitons. So all of this, the structure of four excitons are different excitons with different lattice dressings with, uh, with, with distinct uh, 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 sort of motion, right? Dressing them. So that's what comes out of this. What that allows to say, it, to say is that the lattice normal modes dress distinct excitons and carriers differently. And it is still a, cons uh, a reasonable hypothesis to say that these are exciton polarons with binding energies that are offset by 35 milli electron volts. And so that, that is, that is the, 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 the message from these sort of time resolved uh, vibrational spectroscopies, not time resolved, time domain vibrational spectroscopies. So we see the distinctness of the excitons. But okay, we may have exciton polarons and that, that's, that's, that's useful to know. I think I, Michelle and I exchanged email messages uh, earlier this year where I, I got very excited about some of the work that was coming out of Oxford on DFT of uh, polarons. Basically, they, they came up with a very elegant, from my perspective, elegant way of, of, uh, of modeling or of calculating polarons and things like MOFs and COFs, if I remember correctly, uh, where you could really take into account lattice couplings uh, but in an effective, not in an effective way, but in something that looks like an excitonic type of approach. And so yeah. clumping in interactions in an, in an effective Hamiltonian. And so I think that if we really want to understand the electronic and optical properties of this class of materials, this is a, this is a problem that we need to bring into that type of activity. So this is, I think it's, it's fundamentally important from that perspective. But let's also ask ourselves, what are the consequences now on dynamics? I will not show you some work because of time that, that, that was published uh, also last year in Chemistry of Materials uh, that shows that when you inject photocarriers, let, let's think about an LED. If we want to make an LED of these materials, you're going to inject photocarriers. They're going to recombine. What are the time scales? And how do these, how, do, how does the fact that different specific particular phonons coupled to different excitons differently going to govern the dynamics of charge recombination. And they do. They're not, these are not spectator phonons, they're active phonons. In the sense that you inject photocarriers, they drive the recombination of, of, uh, of electron hole into exciton B, 
And then the non-adiabatic, that means a great radiationless uh, non-adiabatic relaxation of exciton B to exciton A, which is the emissive state in the LED, are completely driven by these, these phonons. And so they are active modes. I won't show you that. What I do want to show you though, are in, 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 in more sort of a quantum dynamic sense, what are the consequences of the fact that these are uh, distinct excitons on, on defacing and population dynamics and defacing and so on, which will be important in some of the other things that we're interested, for example, in optical microcavities. Carlos, so, uh, Shud has a question. Yes, sure. Hi, Carlos. Nice to Hi, see you. Hi, Nice to see you too. Here you are. Um, so, so going on the back a little bit with your uh, pump probe, um, yeah. often when you're, when you're pumping, you, you, you end up in, um, in high carrier uh, density regimes. Right. So does that affect in any way the, the exciton populations? Um, uh, there will be a relaxation process. We, we actually, if I didn't throw away the, the dynamic, the population dynamics in my pump probe spectra, you do see that. Um, and, and, and of course you've got here hot excitons, here you've got less hot excitons, oh, sorry, not excitons, you've got hot carriers here, less hot carriers, and, and there is, there is dissipation and you see hot carrier relaxation dynamics, but the, the resonance Raman spectrum that I measure by pumping higher in energy or lower in energy seems to be uh, the same. So the electron phonon coupling that drives the relaxation dynamics is kind of already imprinted in which, whichever way you pump. Mm -hmm. so that would be I'm not, not, not only concerned, uh, concerned about the relaxation of the excited carriers, but about the population. The number of carriers depends on what the cross section is for the yeah. absorption at that wavelength and how, many, how much juice that I use in my, in my laser. What, what was the fluence of my pulse? So those two things will determine what the actual density is. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I didn't tell you, but we we can vary, these are, so, so at Georgia Tech here, we have a 100 kilohertz laser, um, which means that our pulse energies are, are, are low. And so our fluences, so, so number of you know, joules per centimeter squared is, is, we can go from very, very low to like, uh, like fractions of a nanojoule per centimeter squared to microjoules per centimeter squared. These are done in some intermediate regime because of course we were, all, I, the part that I'm about to get to, we're also looking at trying to look at many body exciton exciton effects and the consequences of exciton fluorons on those. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, no worries. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to get into the details of the experiment for time. Uh, it's an experiment that you can also find in Pat uh, Kambambati's lab in, 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 uh, in McGill done in a, in a different way, but, but, but looking for the same information. Here, this is just a, a, a rather standard implementation of a four-wave mixing experiment where we have three pulses that come into the sample that have an interpulse delay uh, in a geometry, in a very well-defined geometry. Here, we call this this kind of a boxcars geometry, and this is this is we, we're exciting a third-order nonlinear uh, polarization in matter. Essentially, if you want to just have a very classical explanation, very briefly. You, a first pulse will, will excite the ensemble of oscillators in the system. And because it's a short pulse, all of the oscillators are going to start oscillating with the same phase of that pulse. But then because of electron phonon coupling, because of impurities, because of exciton, exciton scattering, that's what I want to study here. You will start losing the overall mesoscopic phase of the system. You'll have the phasing. But before you do, you do that, you, you come with a second pulse in a crossed with the first pulse and, and you still have a coherent response. You, 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 you drive the system again, but now you've got an interference effect of that polarization, a grating that you set off, that all of that is, is oscillating coherently. Then you wait and you come in with another pulse that scatters off the grating into a particular phase match direction as long as you haven't dissipated that coherence. And so you, you of course, can spectrally resolve spectrally resolve this, this coherent emission from the, the third order coherent emission from the sample that is phase matched. And through a Fourier transform measurement, you also spectrally resolve the excitation of these two pulses, the setting up of that coherent grating. 
And this is, gives you a two-dimensional electronic spectrum as a function of time, let's say pump probe time between the excitation and the, that coherent emission. And so if, if that's what you can do, you can do at first instance, nothing more really than what measure what you measure in your linear spectrum. Here's the, my exciton A, my exciton B. This is some substructure that I can, that I can resolve with this two dimensional coherent excitation spectrum. So here's here in the diagonal of this absorption and this emission axis, my two energy axes that are, that are correlated and they're coherently correlated. I see the same features on the diagonal as I would see in the linear spectrum, but I also see cross peaks. Here's a bi-exciton. I'm not going to tell you what it's, why it's a bi-exciton, but this is a bi-exciton. In fact, they're bound by something like 50 milli electron volts, also very strongly bound. But you see several things. You see cross peaks between the different excitons. That means that they are correlated. They share common ground state and also common excited state. They're intrinsic, they're an, an, an intrinsic part of the electronic structure of the system, but, they, but we've already decided that they're distinct. And in this experiment, in this particular geometry, I can also separate homogeneous and inhomogeneous contributions to the total line width. And I'm interested in measuring the homogeneous contribution because that tells me what the defacing rate is if I have an exit for, for a variety of reasons, but here in the density regime that we are, if I have an exciton here and another exciton here, they, they feel the Coulomb correlations amongst themselves and with the rest of the lattice, as I've just mentioned. But this is going to lead to resonant uh, elastic Coulomb scattering that is going to lead to defacing. So I want to measure the defacing for each of the excitons individually. And I can do that with this experiment. So if I do, and this is the idea where I can measure the homogeneous and homogeneous line width. Here, this, the, the, the line shape of these, of these two dimensional spectra tell me that really the defacing is embedded both in the anti-diagonal as well as in the diagonal line shape. I know how to, because I understand the line shape, I, I know how to extract the defacing from that line shape function. It, it's, it's a combination of a void profile in one direction versus a convolution or a product of a Gaussian with a, with a, with a, with an uh, error function. The other one, and, and basically, I, I can pull out the defacing, and, and and which which is which represents a homogeneous Brownian. So I do that. I don't want to say. I just want to show you the results because I'm quickly running out of time. I do my line shape analysis, and I say that the defacing is is this this gamma. That's what l loses that that macroscopic phase coherence that I talked about uh, at the, when, I, when I described briefly the experiment, the defacing has an intrinsic part, basically what's the garbage in my sample? What are the defects? Of course, electron phonon coupling is intrinsic, but through, through phonons, through scattering with defects, whatever, there's an intrinsic defacing rate that it's just my sample, how good is my sample? But there's also a component that depends on density. N is the exciton density, and there will be a, 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 a dependence of, of the defacing on the density. So if I measure the defacing through the homogeneous line width, I measure the defacing as a function of density. Well, here it's plotted as a function of fluence. We see that there is this linear dependence. This is a linear log. That's why it looks like this, but it is linear. That we can then pull out these parameters. And it turns out that if you do that for exciton A, Look at what the intrinsic defacing is. Well, it's it's you know it's 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 measurably different, but it's it's same ballpark. But it is measurably different. Uh, this is the inhomogeneous line width. That that's not very different. This is just uh, there's there is inhomogeneous uh, broadening here as well, and that's what it is. But if we look at the at the density dependence of the defacing, it's very different for exciton A, exciton B, and this intermediate species that now we see exciton, what we call A prime. And this is measurably different. This is really quite clearly different. And it's also a factor of two orders of, of magnitude different that in systems like molybdenum disulfide or molybdenum diselenide, in, in which we have excitons that are, have similar binding energies, but they're very different screening the exciton-exciton interactions in molybdenum, uh, molybdenum disulfide, for example, are screened to a much lower degree than they are in these systems. But each of these excitons is screened differently. 
Okay, that's what this delta parameter is telling us. Not only that, but if we do a temperature dependence, so we ask what is uh, now what what phonon is the, the main effective phonon that is that is responsible for exciton scattering that leads to the facing. We see that for exciton A, we have a phonon that is basically uh, something uh, of on, in the spectral range that I showed you from the from that. Uh, time domain Raman spectrum. In fact, this is pretty close to that M6, that slightly out of, mo out of plane mode. Whereas if we now look for exciton B, this is, this is an energy, a phonon, that uh, Vlad, Vlad worked out and in his master's thesis, that it, it actually, and, and it's in, the, in, in, this, uh, in, in, in the, one of the earlier papers uh, from, from Felix, that, that this is a mode that is mainly uh, centered around the organic cation. So the organic cation is coupling into the inorganic layer, but this is mainly motion of involving the organic cation. This is mainly motion of the lead iodide, both in plane rocking with a little bit of out of plane distortion that is scattering phonon. So again, these are distinct scattering processes and the defacing is distinct for, for each of these distinct excitons. Now, I don't have time because now I, I, I guess, Michelle, that we probably want to leave a good, well, at least five minutes for questions. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, say too much about this other than I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to prove to you, but I am just going to tell you that if we go and look, I, I've showed you basically the absolute amplitude of the spectrum, but this being a Fourier transform technique, I can also show you a real and very contribution to dimensional spectrum. That should be the, the, the real, sh for, for a simple transition, the real part should look like an absorptive spectrum. If we, the UDEM people, if we think back to our electro the, 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 the real part, uh, it, it's backwards from what we would have told you in electro but, but the, 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 re the real part of this two dimensional spectrum is an absorptive spectrum. The imaginary part is a dispersive spectrum. But here, when I show you the real part of these spectra, in fact, it looks like I don't know how to do a Fourier transform because it looks dispersive. And that's true for, these are two sort of uh, conditions for the experiment that we measure the same thing. Here's our biexiton, our excitons. It looks like a derivative thing around kind of the center. So it looks like a dispersive spectrum. But we, we, uh, we now go in time and here it started dispersive, the real part. But at, at, after 230 femtoseconds, it looks absorptive now. Here's a main peak centered around the diagonal. And if I look at the imag imaginary part, it looked like an absorptive component. Here's like a peak center in the diagonal, but eventually it's dispersive. So these are the many body correlations, the exciton, exciton, many body correlations that give rise to this, what, what you call excitation induced defacing. It's this, this defacing process that I described in the earlier slides. It's, it's excitation induced defacing. You've got excitons that feel each other coulombically and, and induce the facing. It's not that they have to get up to each other and bump, it's that these Coulomb correlations lead to the facing. We see that from the zero time spectrum of this two dimensional uh, measurement. And, and, and those correlations are distinctly um, peculiar for the different excitons because the binding to the lattice is peculiar for each of the, of the indiv individual excitons. So the fact that these are exciton phonons not only gives us what the spectral structure is, but it also defines the dynamics in a way that is very non-trivial. And that is something that we also must understand in order to understand dynamics in these systems. And so I think I just want to uh, leave it at that. Uh, just to, this just shows that we also have spectral line narrowing. This is kind of a, Another consequence of the uh, excitation is the facing. I, I won't. I won't get into that, but I will just say that we have exciton defacing, that is in the order of one to two picoseconds. That is uh, that is due to excitation is the facing, that is distinct for, for for uh, for the uh, for the different excitons and uh, the. I didn't. I didn't show you polarization data. I did show you thermal broadening, but the fact that the exciton exciton scattering leading to, to the facing is unique for different excitons also is, I would say, a consequence of the exciton polar nature of these, of these species. 
So the take-home message, excitons in 2D hybrid metal perovskites or exciton polarons, exciton, exciton, many body coulomb scattering and thermal defacing dynamics reflect different lattice dresses dressing for distinct excitons. So with that, uh, I want to thank you and, and I'm very happy to continue the discussion. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, you can see reactions of people clapping. Uh, virtually. <laughs> I, I, I feel it. I hear it. <laughs> you did? Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, we do have some questions. Um, one from Pat uh, saying that he's asking if there's any evidence of coupling to the internal vibrational modes of the ligands of the electronic mm -hmm. polaron exciton degree of freedom. And I think you did mention that at the end with the uh, exciton B. Eh? I'm right. That's right. That's right. So, so, so we don't have at the moment a very good resonance Raman spectrum that covers a range where, where these modes would be important, but we do have okay. non-resonance Raman spectra from, from Vlad's master thesis. Um, and on the, so, so the way we did the impulsive uh, vibrational experiments were with pretty long pulses because uh, one, they sort of optimize the region of, of, of the vibrational region for these phonons in plane. Now we haven't done this with much shorter pulses, which is what it would take to then access the spectral region where the where the higher energy vibrations would also couple. So that's something okay. that has yet to be done. Okay. And I think if Pat is interested, we can talk about that and we can sort of uh, do that together. Well, he doesn't have a microphone, so you cannot talk to him. No, no, no. But he'll, he'll send you. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Richard, uh, let's raise a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, Carlos. Um, hi, hi, Michelle. Um, I, I, is it obvious how you can have a, a different uh, ex, um, polaron binding energies by you know, 25 MeV, which, which for, I mean, adds to uh, something like 100 uh, MeV for the, the, the polaron energy for the lowest lying uh, exciton, while it, it, it couples to phonons with only a few MeV energies. Yeah, so, so there's a couple answers that I can give you. And one is that I don't think that we have yet the whole story. Like I mentioned, we, we, we were able to dissect a very small region of the vibrational spectrum that is relevant. And that is this very low energy region that is, that is, um, that is accessible with the longer, I mean, we, these were like 200 femtosecond pulses that we were mm -hmm. using for that impulsive Raman uh, experiment. And of course that's like Pat rightly points out in his question that that's by no means the end, end of the story. And so I think that the answer to that is we really, this has, in order to quantify things the way that you're asking, I think we just need to do more work with shorter pulses in a broader range. And that's something that, that that is uh, sort of in the works and not, not really yet in my lab because we're really very strongly focused on bi-excitons and hopefully trions and, and looking at all these couplings in, in, the, in the different, frankly, in micro cavities as well. But, but, uh, but, uh, but, the, but that's something that ought to be followed up on and I, I'm very happy to do it collaboratively with, with people in the RQMP. And I think that actually there's something that, that, that David and I also discussed at some point. I think that there's very good terahertz spectroscopy to be done here. Actually, David has a question. So yeah, so I can say I, I agree. There's uh, there's lots of opportunity to do some great terahertz spectroscopy on these. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but we need large crystals. That's the, yeah, the yeah. main problem. <laughs> that that was totally uh, interesting. I, uh, I've got good news and bad news, but we'll we'll talk about those good news and bad news later on. Cool, know, cool. Um, one, so. <laughs> Uh, I was I was wondering about the, um, the Coulomb interactions, the many-body Coulomb interactions in a system mm -hmm. where where it's really layered uh, materials. Mm -hmm. And yeah. does the so I know like in a layered electron gas, uh, Fowl uh, Horlack has done a lot of work on this, where there's there's mm -hmm. a band formed, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, that excitations in that band can then scatter in plane as well. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering for an exciton, um, would there be similar effects due to yeah. you know sort of the you, 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 you've, uh, you've just described the, the NSF proposal that I'm currently working on. <laughs> so, so basically that, that okay. is, that is, uh, that is, that, that is, that is really kind of one of the important questions. But what, what I will say though, I mean, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of single crystal 
a polarization and isotropy along with calculation to be done, and that that's that's something that I am mm -hmm. sort of focused on. What, what I will what I will also say is that is that uh, going back to your earlier question is that of course the the let's say the immediate excitonic correlations those the way I see them those are all confined in the two D plane, but then but that's not what we that's not the that's not really what's all important. What's that's not all of what's important for for these many body scattering problems. The 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 the, the photo excitations in one layer will feel photo excitations in the other one to one degree. Mm -hmm. That may play some role in exciton binding, but the way I see it, probably not a major one. But they will play a role in the Coulomb scattering, and so that is something that that is that is uh, that is important to to also uh, bring into that into that thinking. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And also, I have a question. Um, yes. In these materials, the perovskites has been around for some time, and the, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to uh, to uh, hear you about your you know the perspective of these materials. So they they face some controversy about using lead, and if this issue has been resolved, and I mean they were supposed to be the next like uh, solar cell systems, mm -hmm. but they haven't seen any. You know, commercial use of it. Like, what's the, what do you think about the perspective of these materials now? Um, I I don't think that these materials are. I mean, uh, so there's a lot of activity now about solar cells coming out and in companies and so on. And I think that there will be some some application to it. But I mean, I think that the the problems that are fundamental in these are just never going to go away. Are they really going to be? A standalone technology. I, 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 I don't think I'm. I have the broad vision to really have a very, you know, authoritative perspective. But my feeling is that these are not really standalone technologies. Now, in in light emission applications, that may be a separate thing, uh, because you you can you can um, you can envision LEDs that, I mean, and these two two dimensional perovskites are quite a bit more stable than the bulk perovskites. Or well, these two dimensional right. perovskite like derivatives, let's say, are, are are quite a bit more stable than the perovskites. And so that is that is something that that I think there may be some scope for that, but, but uh, and I think that in the kind of things like in micro cavities, that's another interesting uh, possible real application. Um, I'm not. I'm really not all that confident about solar cells. That that's okay. an opinion. It's not. It's not. I'm not These sure materials were, you know, opinion. yeah. But they were originally designed to make like um, uh, hybrid devices using mobilities. Um, mm -hmm. are, are they still thought to be useful in that context? Or? So there is some work, and I, I know I have a I have a collaboration with a, a colleague here at Georgia Tech called uh, Juan Pablo Baena. Who, who is interested in, in using the 2D perovskites as a layer on top of a bulk perovskite where you will have some of these effects where you might, might combine things like light absorption and uh, as well as transport anisotropies, different sort of the energetics of the interface. as, as not just sort of a, a material in itself, but sort of a, a composite material, 2D perovskites. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that's okay. something that I know I mean he, he's definitely by no means the only one who's thinking along these lines so I know that right. there's a lot of work that that uh, that comes from groups various groups including uh, Giulia um, Biancini who's now in, back in Italy but she was at EPFL who 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 did a lot of work on mixing not not, not interlayers in that way but mixing 2D and 3D perovskites to get something that frankly I'm not sure what it is but maybe somewhere in between who knows but that that uh, that that uh, that is uh, that has promising efficiencies in, in solar cells as well as light emission and so on. Good, yeah. thanks. Good. So um, if there's no other question. I don't see any more questions. So uh, please join me and uh, clap virtually for Carlos. So Carlos, if you can <laughs> you. like unshare your screen so that people yes. can turn on their camera. Sure, and have a chat. And so, and so we can see your cameras and chats. Clap yeah. everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> also, I would like to, uh, Carlos, do you still have some time after? Sure, like, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So 
I invite people if they want to stay, we can have like some uh, informal chat with our friends that we haven't seen for a long time um, mm -hmm. out of the recording. So we don't want to record that other right. part then.